Well, if this is your first time here, the way we function in the sermon is we teach in an expository manner. We try to go through scriptures one verse at a time, trying to stay as close to the text as possible. We're not interested in preaching our own ideas or trying to uh, make this as fancy or as full of expression as possible. What we want is to hear from God and we hear from God through his word. And so we're going to be going through Acts chapter 11. We're going to get through the first, the whole chapter because there's a part of Acts chapter 11 that is exactly the story that we heard last week. And so I didn't see any purpose of going through that story again. Um, we're going to touch on it and then we're going to go on to some of the more important parts of this passage. Uh, my name is Franz. I'm the pastor here. And uh, I'm really thankful that you're here this morning to hear the preaching of God's word. Let's start. In chapter 11 and verses 1 through 3. And we're going to camp out here for a little while and you'll see in just a minute why. Now Roman has already read this. so I'm just going to touch on these passages a little bit. But it talks about the apostle and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Last week we heard the whole story of how Cornelius' household was marvelously saved. The Gentiles had the gospel. The Gentiles had the Holy Spirit. And this was a bit of a shock. It came as a surprise to the Jewish brethren. But when they saw that the Holy Spirit had fallen on the Gentiles, they were astonished and amazed. I'm not sure what their emotions were. I bet they were a little bit mixed. Maybe they were a little bit excited. We'll see later on that Barnabas. We'll learn a little bit more about him. If you remember, Barnabas is the one that found Saul and brought him to the brethren in Jerusalem when they were afraid. So you see there's a mixed, uh, mixed reaction from the Jewish people. Because uh, up till then, the Gentiles were people that they did not associate with, did not, not spend any time with. So this is starting to happen. Well, it continues on here in verse 2. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, all right, after all this happened, he traveled back to Jerusalem. Those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. We're going to camp out here for a minute because this word circumcision is a bit of a weird word. Most of us know what it means or what it is, but we need to understand what it is from a biblical context and why it matters to us. I'm not going to make this awkward, so if you're worried, I'm not going to do that. Um, if you don't know what circumcision is, um, I will read a scripture here that mentions it briefly, but you can look it up on, on Google uh, or whatever. I'm not going to tell you any more than that, okay? <laughs> But we need to know who these people, the circumcision, are. You know, they took a, a noun and they made it into a description of a group of people. What's going on here? We need to understand why Luke includes it in this story. Well, as a cross-reference, you can keep your finger here or just listen here in Acts 15.5. There was a statement that said, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. These were the circumcision. This is a group of Pharisees now who were believers in Jesus. So keep that in mind. They're believers in Jesus, but what made them different is that they had syncretized. Now, if you've never heard the word syncretized, because it's, it's an interesting English word, it means to amalgamate or reconcile differing religious beliefs. For example, when we lived in Papua New Guinea and worked amongst tribal people, there would be groups of people like uh, the Roman Catholics would come in with a priest and he would teach them the Ten Commandments and he would do the mass over them and they would incorporate that into their ritual tribalism. 
And that's called syncretizing, taking a piece of this and putting a piece of this and, and mixing it all together. And then it changed their religion just a little bit. I mean, they were still worshiping demons and they were still doing all their normal tribal stuff. But now they were doing it in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's called syncretism. That's not being saved. That's adding a religion and, and putting it into, um, into the old religion that you had. When I worked in Haiti, um, there's something there called voodoo. If you're familiar with voodoo, it's the worship of Satan. And what they've done is they've taken all the disciples and Mary and Jesus, and they use them as conduits to talk to Satan. And so it looks very religious on the outside, but once you figure out what's going on, they're using them simply as conduits to communicate with the underworld. That's called syncretism. We're not interested in syncretism, but that's what's happening here of these people of the Pharisees. They had syncretized the law of Moses with freedom in Christ. They were believers in Jesus. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but they were adding something to the gospel. Okay, this is the start of a big problem that continues until this day. We don't have the same name for it. We don't call it the, the, the circumcision. We call it legalism. Maybe you've heard of that. What is legalism? Well, it's an outward performance without an inward reality. It often expresses itself in comparison and criticism. Okay, let me say that again. Legalism is an outward performance. If someone gives you a rule, you need to do this. But inside, it's like a child. You say, I want you to go and sit down. And the child sits down and says, on the outside, I'm sitting down. But on the inside, I'm standing up. That's what legalism is. You might want to do it, but you really don't want to do it. And so you do it because you're, you're sure that other people are watching you. And you're afraid that God is also watching you. And if you don't do it, then he's going to take away the free gift of salvation. Now, if God were to take away the free gift of salvation, was it actually free? No, it was dependent on your behavior. Then it would be counted as wages. Then it's not a free gift anymore, is it? Salvation is a free gift. And so legalism is this false idea that once God gives me the free gift, I have to earn the right to keep it. That's what the circumcision we're doing. So let's talk about circumcision for a moment. It was introduced in Genesis chapter 17, verse 11, and given to Abraham. And this is a quote from that, 1711. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And now listen to this. It shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. This is God speaking to Abraham. Just as a note, in that covenant, God never required anything from Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham as a one-sided covenant. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do these things and you will be blessed. He never said to Abraham, and I want you to do anything. He made the covenant with Abraham, but he said one thing. He says, as a token. Now, what does this word token mean? Well, the word in ancient Hebrew uh, so, first of all, the ancient Hebrew used pictographs in order to, uh, for their writing a long time ago. Of course, now we have modern Hebrew. Well, there's, there's ancient Hebrew, and then there's semi-ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew. This is ancient, and these pictographs of token is a picture of two cross sticks that exactly <coughs> resembles a cross. That's exactly what it looks like. That's part of it. The other part of it is the picture of an ox. Okay, so how does those things work together? Well, when a plowman works a field with an ox, he drives the oxen in a straight line towards a mark on the far side of the field. The idea is a covenant or agreement having been arrived at by a straight line directly to a symbol that marks the agreement. Now, I'm going to have to probably explain this again because that could have been a little bit confusing. So the idea of this pictograph of what token is, is this mark and the oxen and how the oxen move in a straight line and the driver of the oxen is looking at the mark and knows that if I keep my eye on that mark, I'm going to arrive at my destination. That's what a covenant is. If you make a covenant with someone and there's a promise made, then you know that when the time comes for that promise to be fulfilled, you will arrive at the destination of that promise. Now, I find it interesting that part of the pictograph is the picture of the cross. This is God's covenant with us. The cross represents the token of God's covenant with us. Now, this pictograph 
was made long before the cross existed. But, you know, God and how he does. The cross is a central part of the new covenant inaugurated by the death of Jesus on the cross. Now, this token of circumcision is the mark of the covenant God made to Abraham. And even though it was added to the Mosaic law, it predated it by hundreds of years. Keep this in mind. This is important. This mark was for the physical offspring of Abraham. Who were the physical offspring of Abraham? The Jews. And they're still the physical offspring of Abraham to this day. And the promise of the coming Messiah. It was not for salvation, but for them, it was a mark indicating faith in God. The fact that they were under the covenant. Now, be very careful to not misunderstand me. The token, the circumcision was not for salvation. It was a mark of the faith that already existed. And this is going to be important because we're going to look at how that relates to the way we see things now in the Bible. So, uh, this idea was lost on the Pharisees, who were teachers and experts in the law, but to whom grace was still a new idea. So when grace came, when Jesus came, and they were able to have faith in Jesus Christ, they syncretized, they took this mark, and they added it, thinking that they could help God out, thinking they could mix their old ideas and the new ideas. Jesus was completely against that. I don't know if you remember the story of the wineskins. Jesus says, don't pour new wine into old wineskins. Why? Because when it ferments, the wineskins will burst. This is the same idea. The gospel of Jesus was new wine. The wineskins, the old wineskins, was the old covenant. They don't mix. You can't syncretize them. You can't bring them together. Why? Because the new covenant fulfilled everything that the old covenant did and rendered it obsolete and set it to the side. It is no good anymore for... Jesus had come and created a new covenant. And where there is a new covenant, there is new laws. Well, the Pharisees wanted to combine these two things. And this is not even uncommon today. There is a lot of people that want to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but they want to live according to a set of rules. And there's nothing wrong with that if they want to live according to a set of rules, as long as it's for them to live according to the set of rules. But what we tend to do in our human nature is then we insist that it's incumbent on everybody to live to those same set of rules. And some of those rules are impossible to live by. They're impossible because they were never meant to save us. So even though the Jews needed to do this back before Jesus came, God was even more interested in the condition of the heart. This is what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 10. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. And he chose their descendants after them. Now think about this for a second. When, he, when, when Moses is writing this, he's talking about their fathers, Abraham, before the law existed. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. And he chose their defend, descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is to this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, And be stiff-necked no longer. God appealed to the Israelites from the basis of love. And said the token should be from a pure heart. A heart that desires to be in relationship with God. Rather than an outward sign, an outward token that says, well, because I'm a seed of Abraham, I belong here. God said, no, I want more than that. I want a relationship. I want a connection And so God spoke to them in that day. He chose them as people to love them and despite their failures as a nation. But he also wanted them to love him back. Hence the reference to circumcision of the heart. So I hope that helps you understand a little bit about where circumcision started with Abraham as a token of the covenant that God made him. Why? Because God loved them how it was adopted by the law and how the Pharisees took the law because they were experts of the law and they applied it very rigorously, very bureaucratically. And then when Jesus came with the new covenant, the old covenant passed away, but the Pharisees held on to it and tried to mix them together. 
And this is where we're at in the book of Acts, the party of the circumcision. They are people that cannot let go of the old in order to grasp the new. They've held, they have a tenuous grasp on the new, but they're hanging on to the old with all of their might. So where does that leave us today? Well, we are not commanded to be circumcised today, but I believe that there is a parallel to this today, which I believe is only the circumcision of the heart. I'm going to be reading from Colossians chapter 2. There's a couple of verses there. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Colossians chapter 2, 11 through 14. It reads like this. In him, who's him? Jesus. You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you, being dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. This verse 13 is, is big. It says, you being dead in your trespasses, we are all dead in our sins before we trust in Christ. But it also says, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Who is he talking to? G Gentiles, right? Uncircumcision of the flesh. He's talking to Gentiles in this moment. He is saying, you, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, Listen to this. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements. What's that referring to? The law. He wiped it out. That was against us, which was contrary to us. Some of us think that the law is a beautiful thing. And if it's understood in the correct way, it is a beautiful thing. But if it's understood as a way of salvation, it is contrary to us. It is not helpful. It leads us to death. We cannot follow the rules to be saved. There is no rule for salvation. There is only trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, is the law important? Yes, it teaches us morality. But here's what's so beautiful about that. We have been given the Holy Spirit inside of us. And as he indwells us, he guides us. It says uh, the law is written on our hearts. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, you have the law written on your hearts. You know what is moral, what is right, what is wrong. The Holy Spirit teaches you. He tells you through the, your, your conscience. He tells you through the reading of God's word. And it says here that Jesus took the law out of the way, nailing it to the cross together with our flesh. And this is where our freedom comes from. And so we don't want to syncretize the old with the new. Why? Because the old was nailed on the cross. It was put out of the way. It is not necessary for us anymore. But then we also see in Scripture that Paul connects circumcision with baptism. Although I think in this case, it is spiritual baptism instead of physical. Now, you know, there's a difference, right? Spiritual baptism, the word baptism, first of all, means to place into, to submerge. It comes from when the ladies used to sit by the riverside dyeing cloth. They would take cloth that was woven and they put it into dye and they would submerge it underneath. They would baptize it. All right. This is where our physical baptism comes from. When we baptize people, we dunk them under the water. We are baptizing them. But there is a spiritual baptism. That is where we are placed into Jesus Christ. We are dunked into Jesus and he is dunked into us through the Holy Spirit indwelling our lives. So there's two aspects to baptism. There's the spiritual side and the physical side. The reason we do the physical side is in memoriam of the spiritual to demonstrate an inward reality. It's an outward sign of an inward reality. So this is how Paul is connecting this to circumcision. I see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as a token or a mark of the covenant God has made with us. Now, in second, don't turn here, but you can just listen to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Do you see how circumcision and the indwelling Holy Spirit are connected? 
See, all those who have the Holy Spirit in them have the mark, the guarantee of eternity in them. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. He is the token. And it just so happens our token is the same token as the pictograph in ancient Hebrew of the cross that's right there on the wall behind me. So the sealing or token of God's guarantee to us is available to all who would believe, not just Jewish men. See how things have changed? Times have changed dramatically with the coming of the new covenant. So in conclusion for circumcision, we can begin to understand that it is unnecessary for Christians to be circumcised in a physical sense because through Jesus, we have already received the token of his covenant with us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. We will also see later on in the Bible that this combining the old covenant with the new covenant becomes a big problem because it essentially creates a boundary keeping Gentile believers from experiencing freedom and essentially puts them in bondage to the Mosaic law and to the rulers who were in charge of this law. Why? Because their influence and power was gone. The Pharisees began to realize, look, if the law doesn't exist anymore for us to follow, then why am I here? What am I doing here? And so they kept up the pressure. Why? Because they wanted that power and authority. Well, we'll see later on down the road. We actually taught through Galatians uh, two years ago here. that Paul writes the letter of Galatians to refute legalism or, or uh, the circumcision severely. And this is what he says, to the degree that any who preach the gospel of grace and add to it the keeping of the law as a requisite for salvation should be cursed. If you don't believe me, it's in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. And so adding to grace is a big mistake. And that's what was happening here in chapter 11. Verse 3. Yeah, that was a long time in verse 2, right? <laughs> but they complained. They said, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Although the, believe, the Pharisees were believers in Jesus, they still had so much religious baggage. Remember we talked about religious baggage the other week? That they couldn't see what had been revealed to Peter regarding clean versus unclean people. God had declared all people as candidates for the grace of God, not just Jews. Aren't you happy about that? Thank God that we have been given the gospel of grace. Because we weren't born Jews. We would have been on the outside looking in. But in fact, because God in His grace opened up the gospel for all. In fact, there's a bit of a misnomer regarding that idea. Even though God picked the Jews out of His own, for His own reasons, for His own plans, salvation was always available to the Gentiles if they were to come to the God of Israel. We've seen that several times in the Old Testament. But God chose the nation of Israel to be the ones to proclaim that word. And Israel didn't do it. So it wasn't that God was being unfair by just choosing one group of people. He chose that group of people for a purpose to bring the message. And he's still doing the same today. He has chosen the church as a purpose for bringing the gospel to every place in the world that has it has never been preached. How well do you think we're doing with that? I'd say we're struggling. We could do much better. God has chosen people to bring the gospel. He didn't he could have used angels, but we, as we learned last week, he did not decide to use angels as gospel messengers. He decided to use people as gospel messengers. Well, from verse 4 through 17, Peter tells the story of what happened. And if you were here last week, you know that story of how he saw the, the vision, how he traveled to Cornelius and all that happened. We're not going to spend our time on that. You can, if, you, if you don't know that story, I'd encourage you to, to read that after we are finished here. So we're going to jump to verse 18. And after Peter finishes telling this story, the, the brothers who were there, when they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. 
you know, this realization on Peter and even the six brothers who had been with him began to dawn on the group that was gathered as well. But there were still some of those there who didn't completely accept it. And that's kind of the beginning of that persecution, this constant friction between the circumcision and those of the way who believed in truth and in grace. Jumping to verse 19. Now we jump into the story of Barnabas and Saul at Antioch. So it says they were scattered after the persecution. So we see how the persecution of the church served a purpose to fulfill the command of Jesus to go on to all the world and preach the gospel. We are a slow people to obey. God often has to intervene and he uses uncomfortable things to get us to move off of our seats, to go into the world and do the things. If you remember, what was Noah commanded to do? To fill the earth. What did they do? They built the Tower of Babel. And they said, hey, let's build this tower lest we are scattered on the earth. What was Adam and Eve commanded to do? Fill the earth. Right? He had to kick them out of the garden. Noah, they had to, he had to scatter them all over the place. Um, even Abraham, he had to tell him, hey, I want you to go to this land and I want to this land that I'm going to give you. And they always just kept on clumping together. And we as a church do the same thing. We clump together. We find what's comfortable for us. And then we stay there. Some of you probably sit in the same chair every Sunday. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just showing that it's human nature for us. I do the same thing. I was in the back. There's a bunch of candles on the windowsill. Have, have you seen those little candles that are back there? I counted them. There's 12. And I moved them so they were centered in the window. So now I feel better about myself. That made me comfortable. See, we do these things. And then God has to bring in discomfort in our life and get us to move from center and move in the way that God wants us to move. So when we are persecuted, when we are struggling, when we're in trials and suffering, know that God is working his purpose to make us a little uncomfortable where we are so that we can do the thing that God wants us to do, whether it's just growing in maturity or actually going out and preaching the gospel. So this persecution that arose over Stephan scattered believers. And although many were only preaching to Jews, some of them were reaching Gentiles. In verse 22, it says, the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Well, because in Antioch, the gospel was being preached, and they were wondering, what is happening? We better send someone we can trust to just figure out what is going on there. When he came and had seen the grace of God, verse 33, he was glad. That was Barnabas' default position happiness, joy, encouragement, gladness. We're not all the same. We're not all like that. Although the, one of the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And we want to see more of that. And Barnabas seemed to have a lot of that. Why? As it continues on, he says, When he had came and seen the grace of God, he was glad, and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. This isn't, he's not talking about continue being saved. Salvation is a once and for all deal when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But to continue with the Lord is to continue to be sanctified, to continue to be in relationship with Him, continue to follow Him, to continue to be discipled by Him. Right? We can stop, right? But, and, but, but the Bible teaches us that if we do stop, then there's the discipline of the Lord as He tries to draw us back into fellowship with Him, back into relationship with Him. It's just like, our, it's like we're His kids and He's disciplining us. And so Barnabas is encouraging them to keep walking with God. So Barnabas was used of God to play a big role in the next step of spreading the gospel. Just remember I mentioned earlier that he's the one that found Saul and brought him to the disciples in Jerusalem when they were very much afraid. It says that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Well, then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. 
Something about Saul had Barnabas' attention. He was the one that introduced him, and now he said, I better go find Saul. You know, this is before social media. He couldn't just text him. And even if he did, Saul probably would have ignored the text for four days, and it would have been too late, right? Isn't that how it works these days? But he went and found him. He brought him to Antioch. And so it was with for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. What does Christian mean? Follower of Christ. Well, to finish up verse 27 through 30, it says that in those days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the spirit there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. Well, see, Antioch is attracting these prophets, and he's, he prophesies of this famine. What was the response of the church? The response was to raise money to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Isn't that something? From being Gentiles despised by the Jews, by now, through the grace and the love of the Holy Spirit, indwelling them, they put money together to bring relief to all those who were in Jerusalem, knowing that this famine was going to come and there was going to be some very hungry people. This is how the Holy Spirit works. If you want to know what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, ask yourself a question. Is it driving you to living a life that would please the Lord? Is it driving you to being generous, to having joy, to being kind? All of these things are clues to help us see whether we are walking in fellowship with God or whether we are not. In conclusion, I want us to see that everything that is happening in this story is as a result of faith. Faith that God is powerful enough to fulfill His promises to us. I want to give you a definition, a biblical definition of faith. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, not by the law, not by following rules, but by their faith. The elders, talking about the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. I have this conversation nearly every week with unbelievers when we talk about Genesis, creation of the world, Adam and Eve, and, and they, they low-key mock me for having faith that God was involved in the creation of the world somehow. I've grown a hard skin or hard shell about this. It doesn't bother me anymore. It didn't in the beginning because I'm a little bit sensitive sometimes. Really? No, not really. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but how do we know that the world was made by God, by His Word, by faith? It's by faith. The evidence will come. But for now, it's by faith. How? So that the things which are seen we're not made of things which are visible. It didn't come from something tangible. It came from God's word, which is intangible. So the evidence of things not seen are mainly found in the lives of the people of faith. From the transformation of the addict to the steadfastness of the martyr, the Holy Spirit gives us power and wisdom to live lives that transcend the normal. In this age of distrust and information, people are struggling to reconcile faith with knowledge. They are seeking for understanding in order to have faith. But the Bible teaches that faith comes before understanding. And understanding begins to happen as a result of faith. Don't mix those two up. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's why knowledge will never lead you to faith. Because it is spiritually discerned, the truth of God. So when I urge you to have faith in God through Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to change your mind and take a risk. I'm not asking you to know or understand or believe everything that's found in the Bible, because I still don't. I don't know everything that's in here. There's some things in here that are unbelievable to me. And I can't wrap my brain around that. I really can't. 
But I do know that Jesus is the Son of God. How do I know this? By faith. And that by believing in Him, you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That is Acts chapter 11. And I know we spend a lot of time on circumcision, um, but I hope you understand the concept that God is more interested in the circumcision of the heart than anything outward, anything physical. And so he has given us a token, the Holy Spirit. And if you are a believer in Jesus today, the Holy Spirit resides in you. And if you're not a believer of Jesus Christ today, the Holy Spirit does not reside in you. But he very easily can simply by choosing by faith to trust that Jesus is who he says he is. That he is the Son of God. That he died on the cross for our sins. And that by faith in that, our sins are forgiven and we have eternal life. That is the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for your kindness to us in sending us Jesus. Thank you for this passage in Acts 11 as we learned a bit of the history of circumcision and the battle that's being faced by the church as they move into yeah, dealing with people that are syncretizing the gospel, bringing in different religions and diluting the pure grace of the salvation of Jesus Christ. I ask that you help us understand this in the way only you can help us. Would you work in our hearts to draw us to you in relationship? And for anyone here that doesn't have a relationship with you, would you draw them to yourself that they would have faith to trust in you and be saved today? Thank you for your kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.